Good afternoon. <laughs> With this um, this title, uh, I, did, I do agree warrants some applause, <laughs> as well as the fact that the person um, standing to my right, um, house left, um, is here with us today. My name is Shannon Jackson. I'm a co-teacher of this course in public lecture series, and it is a true pleasure and privilege to welcome you to another event in our Thursday noon series, Video Art in Context, uh, a series that is embedded inside of a large public course that is funded entirely through the generosity of the Cramlick Art Foundation and advancing its mission to support education and public engagement in the field of video art. In welcoming you here today um, to UC Berkeley and to BAM PFA, we acknowledge that we are sited on the unceded ancestral land of the Ohlone people and that the land from which we benefit is a site of continued life and culture uh, and of continued importance for the Ohlone people. In making these kinds of land acknowledgments, which have now become routine throughout our region, uh, we acknowledge a certain uh, indebtedness and accountability, but of course those acknowledgments mean relatively little without follow-up in terms of action and systemic change. While that continues in different parts of our region and throughout UC Berkeley, um, and because and allied with that mission, it gives me that much more pleasure and privilege to be able to welcome today Jeffrey Gibson. Gibson is a multidisciplinary artist, um, a multidisciplinary artist who merges traditional Native American materials and forms with those of Western contemporary art to create a new hybrid visual vocabulary. Gibson is a member of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians and of Cherokee descent, and has forged a multifarious practice that has participated, prompted his participation in a range of solo and group shows all around the country and the world, including most recently Aspen, Portland, Denver, and Santa Fe, internationally Canada and Australia, and very recently in New York at the New York Ballet. Also for us here in the Bay Area, we're privileged by the fact that he helped, his work has helped, helped to open the, one of the newest venues, art venues in San Francisco, the Institute for Contemporary Art in San Francisco. His 10 screen installation, This Burning World, is currently on view. A past MacArthur Fellow, Gibson draws influence in materials, processes, media, and iconographies from a range of sources. His work has featured the use of mixed media, including Native American beadwork, trading post blankets, metal studs, fringe, and jingles. But he's also found inspiration in events that are, revolve around dancing and performance and popular culture, including powwows, nightclubs, and raves. Says Gibson of his practice, he allowed himself to follow his instinct to use materials and formats that refer to what is acknowledged as signifying Native American in a hope to communicate and compl com uh, complicate a specific subject, i.e. Native Americanness. The materials I use, he says, can communicate both individuality and interconnection. I want to complicate their use in hopes conversations will open up. I'm interested in the unraveling and loosening of static definitions rather than resolving them one way or another. Those conversations have certainly been opened up by Jeffrey's practice, prompting, for instance, the great native artist and intellectual Jimmy Durham to dub Jeffrey Gibson our Miles Davis. We have the pleasure, as I said, to welcome Jeffrey today in order to reinforce his incredible work uh, in San Francisco at ICA San Francisco, This Burning World, which you haven't seen, you must see before it closes, uh, as well as to hear more generally about his cross-media practice, the context of his work in video art and across all kinds of media, as well as to think deeply with him about his political and social and spiritual commitments. So help me welcome Jeffrey Gibson. Uh, 
Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I was just saying I've spent more time in the Bay Area in San Francisco than I have in many years. Um, and I really, really enjoy it here. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, when I, I just got into town yesterday and we were um, talking about the talk today and I went back and I kind of um, put a lot more video into the presentation. Um, so that's what I'm going to show mostly. And um, I think a lot of people who know my practice don't know that I um, have been working with video for going on almost eight years at this point as, as far as creating standalone artworks in video. And um, so I want to start here. This was actually, I had, I had played around with video for maybe even like 10 years prior, prior, prior to this. This is 2015. And the Denver Art Museum asked me if I would um, come there and make an artwork if they could commission something. And um, in my 20s, back in the 90s, I um, worked at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. And uh, my job was to work as a research assistant on the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. And um, if you're not familiar with that, it's a law which enabled federally recognized tribes to request the return of objects that were culturally related to their, to their culture. Um, and the terminology that, you know, that deemed eligibility is, is definitely in question, but I did that for about four years and had a huge impact on me. Um, my job was to prepare objects for to be viewed by um, delegations of tribe members and elders. And so I experienced a lot of different languages and um, a lot of contentiousness in the room um, and also a lot of different ways of thinking about and handling uh, artifacts and cultural objects. Um, the biggest lesson I walked away with was that these objects were alive and that um, keeping them in museums really reflects a kind of hostage situation that um, what, what was most uh, impactful for me was when the delegations would come in were for people to come and sing to the objects and to play music for the objects, to speak to the objects. And um, occasionally we could bring them out into the sun, they could be fed, they could take part in ceremony. So this was sort of a very, um, it, was, it was really eye-opening because it kind of seemed very impractical by the standards of the museum. But, um, but so this video made in 2015 uh, was, was me requesting to be able to go into the collections, the, the North American indigenous collections, and bring elders and dancers into collections to perform for the objects. So that's what we're going to see here. My name is John Imhula Jr. I'm Kiowa. I'm from Oklahoma. Uh, member of the Ohomo War Dance Society and the Kiowa Gord Clan Society and the Kiowa Black Legged Society. My Indian name is Pongute. Pongute means yellow bead, big work. Pongute. Oh, the core con, yeah, doll, you know, the kid I got, but they don't take it all the time, so I'm gonna go. Don't make all the time, come back. They put it all the time, go. Go to my doll, honk, and go to my doll, you know. So, um, we're gonna look at lots of clips today, but this was a one minute clip from um, the video titled When Becomes the Other. This is John M. Hula in the hat and Virginia Allrunner, um, both who have since passed since the video was made. Um, and I think working with this was learning so much about permissions and things that people feel all of the performers throughout the video were, um, they were improvising as they were speaking. Um, you see people get emotional, that's not scripted. It's just sort of the way that I work with people is to put people in situations to talk to them, obviously, to help them understand what to expect, but then they have their real kind of reaction. Eventually, we build on that. And then, of course, the editing process. So this idea of permissions was something, um, permissions, uh, seeking permission from objects that many people would consider inanimate was sort of the big takeaway from, from this project. Um, jump forward to 2020, 
This is um, Sarah Ortegon, who was also in that initial first video that I just showed you in 2015. And Sarah Ortegon um, is, a, is a really well-established, really well-recognized jingle dress dance, um, I don't know, jingle dress dancer, I suppose. And um, this is a still from the video that I'm going to show you. I was asked by Times Square Arts in New York City to create videos for the, the monitors right in the center of Times Square. And I wanted to um, pay homage or uh, give some space to acknowledge missing and murdered indigenous women, the movement. And, um, and Sarah wanted to do that as well. And the jingle dress is a healing dance. The sound of the jingles is uh, meant to call ancestors. It's meant to be healing. And this was actually debuted on March 7th. So that was the day that everything shut down for COVID. And because of COVID, it ended up staying on the Times Square monitors for, um, I believe, about eight or nine months. I um, just want to pause that for a sec. This is... Um, this is what it looked like. So the monitors were basically, uh, I think we had about 70 to 80 monitors that were taken over for about the last three minutes of every day. So what you just saw is a kind of nine, uh, nine screen and screen version that we show in museums um, or galleries, but just so you get a sense of the scale of this. So the idea, um, traditionally the jingle dress dance is gendered. Um, it's for women that has changed. Um, now there are, there are both uh, female and male presenting jingle dress dancers. Um, but I'll just, let me see, we're going to go back. Okay, here we go. And, uh, this is a little bit loud, so we'll wake you up. <laughs> um, How are you? Back with you on Off The Hook Radio. It's DJ Buddha Blaze. You know, electric power is going on tonight. That's right, a tribe called the Red. Are you going to check them out? Give me a call. Let me know. Let's get into the latest from Nation to Nation. This is Sisters. Um, the whole video is two, uh, two minutes and 50 seconds, so it's not huge. All of the regalia is Sarah's own. Um, she chose the music. The music in here is by who at the time was known as a tribe called Red, now known as Hallucination, and the track is um, called Sisters. And so, um, uh, yeah, so that kind of just like would take over all of Times Square for almost the full year. Um, and... Um, this piece um, was there's I work in a few different kinds of videos. So the videos of like Sarah are made you know specifically for the installation. This was a performative video, which is another part of my practice where I've gotten more involved in the editing. Um, this piece is titled Like a Hammer. Um, and this is the first garment. This is one of the material objects that we make at the studio. This one was made for me. Um, it probably weighs about I'm going to guess about 40 to 50 pounds. Um, and so when you wear it, it's for a durational performance that does exhaust your body. Um, this is uh, a still from the video. It's just myself um, in actually my studio um, with these drawings behind me, and I'm enacting the movements of um, the animals that are named in, in the text drawings. Um, and um, the idea for this really came about from Choctaw Social Dances, which is... Um, they're the dances that the, the collective group of people move in the shape or in the ways that other animals do. And so that's where I started just thinking about animals that were in my life. I live in the Hudson Valley. Which animals do I see? And then um, enacted movement. And it was really just a prompt for me to think about like how 
how to move differently. And the whole performance lasted, I think, about an hour and a half. And ultimately, the video was edited down to 38 minutes with some editing, um, which I, like sort of affect editing. Um, so some things we play with so that so that I don't I'm, it's not always just sort of like a point and shoot video. Um, this video was from 2017, uh, finished in 2018. And this is Macy, who is a self-identified trans woman. She lives on the reservation in Mississippi, um, on the Choctaw Reservation. And um, these are three clips. I wanted to, I think when I was going through the videos this morning, I was thinking about how long these ideas have been kind of coming up in my work. And that's how I chose. And it, it really made me think that, you know, starting with my time at the Field Museum and thinking about objects has moved on to think about um, animals, has moved on to think about you know, the animals that are the hides on the drums or the teepee liners or the moccasins or the dresses and how those animals, I, for, since I was a child, I've never felt comfortable seeing myself as above the animals. I've always preferred to see us both as different species of animals. And I think that that has eventually led into thinking about also not only the land, but um, the natural environment um, and how difficult for me it is to almost distinguish between our made environment versus the natural environment. So it includes people and it includes different kinds of environments. Um, so this one is, um, I'm going to show you three short clips. Um, the video is not that long. It's only eight minutes. So what you see there is Macy getting ready in her room um, as she prepares to go work as a server. This is the um, the Choctaw Native Casino on the reservation. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, and this is sort of from about two thirds into the video. <laughs> So the sound here is um, uh, sung by Tanya Tagak, who is a throat singer. And so um, I had uh, contacted her to do the sound, which, of course, is also based in the sounds of nature and the sounds of animals and, and, and breath and breathing. Um, and so I think to me, when I think about environment um, and climate, they're, they're all inextricable from, for me. They're all we, we are inextricable from it. They are, um, it's, it's difficult, it's impossible, I think, to actually separate us. Um, and this is where it ends, which is Macy, um, who I didn't realize had never actually gotten fully dressed on the reservation. Um, and two weeks after this video was made, she lost her job and has not been employed since then. And that was years ago at this point. So, um, okay, here's the... <laughs>
then the video ends with Macy fully um, coming out of the water, and then she walks back out and into the forest. Um, this is a video that was shot during COVID. Um, I believe it was shot in 2020. Um, I was uh, feeling really, uh, you know, we'd all been locked in. No one knew what, I didn't know what was happening in the world. And so I was just, I was trying to do everything I could to kind of like keep it together and keep working as an artist. And, um, and I realized that I started looking more and more to nature as a place to focus and center myself and wanted to start making work. And I reached out to other artists to find out if anyone else was feeling similarly. And, um, they had. And so, um, this video is meant to represent a group of people who are, um, kind of, they're, they're collected by this garment that they're wearing, but then you'll see them performing in different spaces. The drums uh, we made in the studio, um, obviously inspired by bucket drums of all different kinds. Um, so that's hide over uh, commercial buckets and um, the garments were made in the studio. This is how this is shown in an institution with the video screen on the opposite wall. Um, and here's a clip. The full video is almost 18 minutes long. Um, and we worked with a number of people. We would have to shoot them independently because of COVID. And so everyone is, for most, for the most part, you'll see some people together. But And this video um, is titled To Feel Myself Beloved on the Earth, which is an excerpt from a Raymond Carver poem titled uh, Late Fragment. And um, so we were very lucky. Well, we were lucky, actually. There was a lot of amazing musicians who were not on tour due to COVID and who were dying to come and have some sort of gig. So um, it was shot between Art of My, uh, my home, um, where generally uh, parks, we have lots of parks around us, and then also at the West Beth Center in New York City. There's another still. Uh, it, I really love this video. It was one of my favorite uh, pieces. And I also want to say something about the collaborations, which um, this is MX, for instance, who I've collaborated with, my gosh, at least five or six times. We're getting ready to collaborate on something else coming up soon. And um, and I really don't, you know, I, I get attracted to people for what they're already doing. And it's sort of like going and asking them, like, can you contribute that to my project? So it's not really like we're not trying to hash out a third thing between the two of us. I mean, it does happen, but um, my goal is really just it's like uh, you have something that I want. And that's that's what the nature of a lot of the collaborations are. 
So um, when I'm on set, I'm directing, but I'm really looking at what they're already doing, and I just try to choreograph from that. Um, so it's really the nature. MX is a repeat collaborator. Um, Roxy Romero, Orlando Harbutt, um, Devon. Uh, so a lot of the people in this video I've collaborated with numerous times. There's another still. I also want to talk about, because I know you guys are working in video, um, and this is something that actually, some, I don't remember who taught me this a long time ago, but you know, to really consider who you're putting in your videos, like what bodies, what, what narratives of those bodies are there, how people read those bodies, I think are extremely important. And it's something that when we um, are, are looking for casting and stuff like that, that's always, you know, a project that we're working on right now the hardest part for me is always to get um, age diversity. Um, it's very easy for me to get young people, but it's really difficult to get a sort of 70 year old body, you know, running across, especially because I do like working with people who are not trained performers as well as people who are trained. But we've found some people recently. Um, so after I made that video, um, well, actually, no, maybe I wanted to, show, I wanted to show that one first because it's the more kind of upbeat one. Um, this next video I'm going to show you was actually commissioned by the Wattis Institute here um, in 2022 or 2021, I believe. Um, and it was a video that, you know, we were in another weird place with COVID. Like it felt like another level of like what in the world's going on. And um, so showing this video was not so easy. I'm going to kind of jump through in sections. But, um, you know, when I think about environment, like it's not just the environmental in the way that I think a lot of people think about ecological environment, it's also just sort of what surrounds us and how much that includes um, ecological concerns. But um, so at this point, at least where I live, and I don't know what was happening around here, but in Columbia County in New York, people were beginning to like put American flags up everywhere. And it felt like it was meant to be in a sort of patriotic tribute. But it started feeling very aggressive to me, and it actually started making things feel less safe. Um, and so that's sort of what the video is about, and kind of processing those emotions, and nature plays a part in that.
like giving guys teasers like the whole time. But it's really, um, but I, I uh, that was also shot um, in my studio. It was shot also all around Columbia County um, in the Hudson Valley. Um, I worked with uh, three different videographers, and um, generally when we're making a video, we collect, oh my gosh, at least 20 times more footage than goes into the final. And I think, you know, we were talking last night about my use of patterning and ICA installation, and I think what I'm noticing just now is that all of this kind of overlaying that I'm doing is very similar in the sense of wanting to see multiple narratives and multiple trajectories kind of intersecting in one space. And that's what pattern um, definitely allowed me to do there. Um, this was the the, the um, uh, project titled um, "Because Once You Enter My House, It Becomes Our House," um, and it's uh, this is the ziggurat, which is based off of Mississippian mound builder culture um, architecture, and um, which is where the Choctaw people would have come from, would have originated. Um, and the way we activated this structure over the course of about nine months was. Um, to, to do performances, which we would create videos from. This one was a collaboration with Raven Chacon, who is a Diné composer. Um, and uh, he made a video in Albuquerque. We would communicate, but I'm just gonna show you a little bit here. Um, what, I'm, what I'm wearing on my head here is a directional speaker. And so I'm playing Raven's sound to the trees in the park. So that's what this part of the video is about as I'm walking around and introducing myself and playing sound for them. Um, this is Raven. Uh, this is from his, from his video, um, and I will... And, uh, you know, the point of this video, Raven and I uh, have known each other for a long time, and um, we both are generally always dressed in black. I love the color, <laughs> dark color. And so we were talking about that. Um, and the title of this video is A Warm Darkness, because we started talking about um, darkness as a place of comfort and a place of safety and a place of feeling um, safe. Yeah. And and so... Um, this video, what happens is we're in the, we're just as the sun is going down, I'm speaking to the trees and playing this sound. There's this group of youth who are on the structure who as the sun is going down, they begin to drape the structure in black fabric. And as the sun goes down completely, the structure disappears. And um, what you see um, here is MX, who I told you we've collaborated a number of times. MX um, comes and, and and activates the sculpture as this kind of rave for one. Um, and so this idea that something happens inside of this, this structure that is really not anything that anyone, anyone's really aware of was what is presented. Um, and we, we were using a lot of, a lot of drone footage. Um, and this is where kind of towards the end when um, we're sort of like, well, what happens inside of there? What does MX do? And this, this footage was...
Um, and again, I I didn't tell Raven what to compose. I didn't ask MX to, to wear anything in particular. I didn't ask for specific movements. It really is, um, especially from the beginning when I started collaborating with people, I think the goal has been to deepen those collaborations and to think about what different kinds of collaborations can be. Um, and also while respecting, you know, what, what Raven has crafted over his lifetime and, um, and to not, I really don't feel like I could make it any better than what, what he already does. So that invitation is so important. Um, this is a recent installation. Um, at, this was at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Um, it's just opened at the end of last year. Um, this bench, I worked with a couple of furniture designers in Sydney uh, who made this really fantastic kissing chair. Um, and then the pieces on the wall. And so I just wanted to kind of show how things find their way back into the work that gets produced. Um, the type, this uh, type, title of this project is The Stars Are Ancestors, um, which I've been uh, talking more and more to, to geologists and just sort of comparing it or thinking about it in relationship to indigenous um, philosophies about the land and also kinship philosophies. And it was just amazing to see that there's so, I mean, it's just, it's such direct overlap. Um, it's, they're not actually distanced at all. You know, the science of it is that, yes, we are the result, we're the living result of, of uh, geology and gases and explosions. And that's actually how we got <laughs> to where we are today. It's the beginning of us. And so that that is still in our DNA and that we really are related to all of these things that surround us. And I started thinking more and more about, um, just sort of the idea, like, what is it that we're not treating the land better? Why is it that we're kind of sabotaging ourselves and the land constantly? And it kind of just keeps coming back to, you know, thinking about just sort of psychology of some form of like self-loathing, some sort of like, uh, some sort of death complex that we just, it's, it's, it's weird. For, it's, it's actually not weird anymore, but it's, it's interesting for me to consider how we are collectively behaving and why we are behaving those ways um, and why we're not changing. Like, why are we not making the changes that need to be made in order to treat our extended bodies better? Um, and if we harm those parts of or those appendages of our bodies, you know, we are also harming ourselves. Um, here's the pieces that are in the installation. Um, and there's a much longer story about where all of this kind of aesthetic is coming from. But this one says a pure and simple thing, and um, which is, yes, an homage to Dolly Parton. So there's also that layer of the work, which we're not really talking about today. Um, I can do whatever I want and a question of trust. Um, there's lots of text in here. Uh, the beadwork is all done in the studio. Um, the forms are based off of Tuscarora, um, whimsy forms, Victorian forms from the turn of the century. Uh, there's everything from vintage pins in here. Um, some, um, and then the rest of it's just beadwork here. Um, this one says the stars are ancestors. And the dimensions on these is everything is um, at, its, at its longest length. The panel, the inset panel is six feet tall. And this one says speaking to the trees and kissing the ground. Which brings us to San Francisco. Um, and I, there's a, you know, Allie and I have talked about her invitation to me to come. Um, I had actually, as much as I've been doing video and performances so much for the past couple of years, um, I had mainly done exhibitions of paintings and sculpture. And so when Allie asked me, I said, the first thing I said is I said, I just don't want to do another show of paintings and sculpture right now. And she, uh, we started talking about the video and, and I had already proposed to, um, a collector about doing a subterranean room. And um, I couldn't really figure out, I kept telling them, I was like, I just need, we need to make the room and I need to be in the room to know what happens next. And um, so that had been on my mind. And when Ali asked me, I said, can we remove the floor? And uh, she actually immediately said yes. Um, and the idea was to speak to the land underneath the building. Um, especially because it's a brand new institu institution. We talked about um, the idea of institutional memory and how can you start uh, an institutional memory off differently. So the original idea was to have a subterranean room in the center. And for lots of reasons, that's really problematic, um, just, just permit-wise and getting through 
all of that. But I also ultimately didn't feel like it was necessary to do what I wanted to do. The videos were always a part of this. They didn't quite look like this in the first kind of iteration. Um, but we shot collectively. We had four videographers shooting around the Hudson Valley, also in Pennsylvania, also in San Francisco. Um, I believe there was maybe California. Um, and we collected um, hundreds. Well, we have over a thousand videos um, tracking the seasons. And so, um, and eventually when it came time to editing, figuring out how to, um, how to make this all work together. So it didn't feel completely chaotic. Um, and also, um, to figure out how to let the land and the images of the land and the movement in the land be the subject and not just kind of fade into the background, especially when we brought in the, um, the vocalist, Joan Henry, who is a traditional song carrier to sing. And she is singing specifically to the land in the videos, but she's also singing to the land underneath the building. So the troughs on the side here, that is the dirt that's underneath the building. That's, that's everything that's there. Um, and uh, it's a 20 minute loop. Um, Joan makes up the sound and I've worked with the same sound engineer for a few years now named Trist Tristan Shepard, um, who's I think done all of the sound, the sound mixing for what you've heard today. And here's, um, to give you a sense, this is a, just a simple four screen uh, minute. <laughs> so soothing it makes me want to lay down um uh, this piece uh is also in the back of the ica it's titled the future is present and it's a remake of a piece from 20, 2013 that i did at um the ica in winnipeg um and this idea of bringing in a tree um to have something kind of real and present and physical was important to me and um also because joan and i had talked a lot about um, thinking about, you know, plants and animals and ourselves and this idea of permissions or how to speak, how to speak to the land, how to speak to plants and animals. And it's been kind of a wild ride um, to, to know Joan and to work with her because, um, you know, everything has its own language. And so for us to presume that anyone understands English or if anyone understands our body language or anything like that, it, to me, it's been really interesting to think about to reverse it as if like my goal is to try to, to communicate um, and to feel really like I have no idea what I'm doing, you know? And so you just make these attempts. Um, this tree uh, was hit by a drunk driver. And um, so we were able to, we got permission to remove the tree because it was dying. And, um, and we were able to get the roots um, with it. And so it sits in this room um, and the window is a vinyl mural on the, on the glass where the sunlight comes through. And then the sound, um, Joan sang a song specifically to this tree. And so that's what I'm gonna play for you. Hey. 
Alle se i nadgang. Vi siger. Alle se i nadgang. Kloak i nadgang. Alle se kloak i nadgang. Vi siger. And I hear you. I hear you. Is that the deal? Kloak i. Shhh. He won't. He won't. He won't. He won't. He won't. We are listening. We are done. We are watching. We are seeing your star. All your guests. And you are willing to not go back to the earth that we might see. Vado a vedere. Vado. Andiamo. Mi guacci. Mi attacchi. Mi guacci. Mi ci. Wopida. Wopida. So many words. What do you mean? For thank you. Mi guacci. And you know them all. And you wait. Will I learn? Will I learn? Will I learn? Will I learn? Ascoli. Ascoli. Thank you. Um, we do. We do definitely have time for um, for questions, and I encourage you to ask absolutely whatever you're wanting to know. Uh, I'm a pretty open book, so um, please. Hey, thoughts. So, can I just can uh, for ushers as well as myself, anyone who feels a question brewing, can you raise your hand, and we'll kind of get a sense. All right, starting here. Um, hi. Um, hi. I noticed you recorded a lot of like people performing, right? For example, uh, someone getting ready for the day or someone walking to the water. So how does the act of how, what do you think? Like, how does the, the action of actually capturing, um, the performance actually shift, um, the relationship between the audience and the performer versus like how, is it intensified? Does it intensify the statement, or does it like change the how people relate, like how audience relate with the artist or relate with the performer? Um, I mean, I think I'm really influenced by, um, you know, I'm a kid of the '80s, so when MTV happened music and music videos, and I think so much, you know. I was we were talking last night about th this generation, and I just kept thinking I was like, this is a generation of content creators, which didn't ever exist in the way that it does now. And I think, um, you know, that period for me was was an early chapter of that, and thinking about um, the way that recording something that may otherwise not be seen as significant, just projecting it, it suddenly becomes significant, and I think. For me, it's um, hopefully creates kind of a, a relatable moment. Um, and sometimes, I think sometimes also, we've been so shaped by cinema and television and the kind of construct of narratives that I think um, we can almost relate. I, I find sometimes I can almost relate more to like a moment in a film as being real than I can in reality. 
if that makes sense. And so sometimes I try to construct that, you know, like how would this happen in a, in, in a cinematic way? But as far as like what it does, I think it just maybe dramatizes it a bit. Yeah, I think you're trying to it. Yeah, try trying to make I would say a statement regarding environment, regarding it's like human as an animal species, uh, regarding the land. So do you think the act of you recording the performance actually intensifies the statement or just put it in front of all of the audience? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question directly, other than what I took from it was that I actually try not to make statements generally. And I think that sometimes the way that I use those moments that you're talking about are transitional. You know, they're really there to, to create transition from one space to another space. Um, and it's also part of like, I'm just thinking about the scene you're talking about Macy, where, where she's getting ready in her room. We didn't move anything. We didn't like change any lighting. We didn't, you know, everything is sort of like looking at someone's space as kind of being exactly what it's meant to be right and so but i think the other thing is that for me i guess what i do want to say is that those are all linked to environment they're all linked to environment when macy walks out of her house and she's in what looks like a sort of 1970s prefabricated home that's a, that's a tribal home that's what a tribal home looks like today on the choctaw reservation and for me it's significant because those homes are in their materials and in their construction are the antithesis of indigenous views, traditional indigenous views on the land. So they're not, again, they're not, not a part of that conversation. I think I would be, I would be faking it if I showed Macy um, in the land, because that's not how she lives. You know, that's not how many of us live. And so her, the idea of the video is that she chooses to return to the land she chooses to transform in the land and she chooses to self-baptize in the land. So if that has to be set up in order for that to be significant, I have to set it up that she's coming from another place. Um, so we'll uh, take a few more questions along this road, but Thomas could get a uh, signal to the audience. Great. Uh, okay, so first a comment and then a question. Um, I really appreciate how you so thoroughly complicate the like supposed binaries, thinking about um, you know male, female, human, animal, nature, culture, um, traditional ancestry his histories, and then like modern times, and it's it's really amazing. Um, Okay, and so kind of an unrelated question. I was wondering if you make work that is um, only for Choctaw um, eyes and, and like work that you keep within the community. I don't. Um, I think, you know, my, um, I mean, that's a much larger conversation. But when I say that I don't, I think part of it is that um, I feel like when I'm very cautious about the things that I speak about, so I know there's many things that I shouldn't speak about. And if I wanted to, I need to go seek permission. And I think for me, up to this point in my career, I feel like there's plenty of things for me to, to talk about. Um, and also, um, I there's something about presuming sort of what what Native people need that has always like made me feel uncomfortable. And so I always say my work is available. It's actually why I got into video, because a lot of cultural and heritage centers don't have the budgets for shipping and creating and installation and um, temperature controlled galleries and things like that. But video is something that I could just digitally send, you know, and it was a way that I thought, OK, this I can make accessible. Now, when it, I get a lot of requests, you know, imaginative, like other um, museums, primarily a lot of them in Canada, in Europe, um, but from indigenous curators. And, um, and I think that because I work from such a, an intertribal perspective that, um, I think most people would recognize it, but, um, but I don't actually make anything specifically for. Yeah. Okay. So I thought the the transitions you did for your videos, uh, specifically the one that's in the ICA right now, mm -hmm. I thought that was really, really cool. And I was wondering 
kind of what your creative process was for like for, for like making the decision to like overlay things like that yeah it's interesting um i i really um the the very first kind of proposal did not have things overlaid it looked almost like very much like surveillance cameras i wanted you to be surrounded by hundreds of smaller videos watching things and then that kind of surveillance vibe just was not right right and so we started thinking about like well how would somebody know this was like jeffrey gibson's work like how do we how do we get that feeling across and i am always generating patterns for many things and so um the other thing was once joan came in and we did video joan so you see her kind of come into the the spaces of the pattern but once we put joan in front of the um the landscapes the problem was that it, this figure ground relationship just immediately is triggered. And so Joan becomes the subject and the land becomes the background. And that's absolutely not what was meant to happen. The, the land is meant to be the subject and everything else is meant to be either embedded in the land or somehow in support of. So the pattern actually enabled me to do that. Um, it also um, obstructed her in a way where she's no longer kind of an individual that you can have relationships with. You can have relationships with her sound and that sound um, in, in um, relationship to the imagery. But, um, but that, was really, that was really the choice. And once we kind of tried it once, um, I was like, oh, yes. And then we kind of built from there. But that happened actually very late in the process. So it was a little, a lot to figure out. Um, throughout your presentation, you had a, you mentioned a lot of different mediums mm -hmm. and I was curious to know, like, what medium do you find, um, to be your favorite in conveying, um, your creativity? Um, it's really hard right now because I, you know, I've been practicing for around 20 years and so... I think um, everything has evolved pretty organically, but now it's like a really broad spectrum of choice. And I think um, they all have different possibilities. So video, for instance, every time I make a video, I say it's the last one I'm ever going to make because it is so much work. And I know there's many different ways of making a video, but I like to shoot a lot. I like editing has to be perfect. I love sound. I love mixing. Um, all of that stuff has to happen. And so I like working with people actually who are sort of like industry standard. And I also like working with artists and uh, they think very differently. Um, but, you know, painting, it's like the same thing. It's like the paintings have gotten more laborious. Um, but I think if I was, and I also work with a team of people almost always at this point. So that has influenced a lot. Um, I don't know if I really have a favorite. Everything just takes so much time. And so the payoff is really like, like with the ICA installation, the payoff actually wasn't the opening. That was just like relief. Okay. Like the payoff happens now. It's like being able to go and see it with some sense of understanding and some distance because I'm really such an in-process artist. Everything happens because we do something and I can respond to it and figure out the next step and I can do something next and then have some time to look at it. So that's, that's difficult working with a team of people because everyone's like waiting for what happens next. Um, but um, so I don't really, right now I don't really have a favorite. Previously I would have said painting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, you said when you look for performers to collaborate with, that you look for people that can bring like something new or something that you're interested in to kind of like mesh with your artwork and your vision. So I was just wondering like what kinds of things you look for. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, generally when we do an open call with, for instance, a museum, you know, it's generally, we always start with wanting to amplify and prioritize indigenous voices and bodies. Um, uh, people of color, um, and then the list from there goes into, you know, looking for um, age diversity, uh, generational diversity, and then also really the, the goal of that is to encourage that, but also it's completely open to everyone. So that changes wherever we go. And um, so for instance, like right now, 
um, MX, who you saw is going to be choreographing, who I've never actually worked with MX as a choreographer. Um, so MX's body is a trained dancer's body, you know, and he's somebody who has grown up in a very spiritual environment. That's how we met. And um, very intuitive when it comes to sound, very good at working with people, but also has this, always comes with like a look, you know, so that's MX and MX will be in this performance. One person we're trying to get is a writer named Ariel Twist from Toronto, who is a very young, um, self-identified matriarch in her community. And um, I find her kind of the way she looks really crucial to this performance. Um, she is uh, a self-identified trans woman. Um, and I think I'm just interested in her. You know what I mean? It just gets in my head and I, I'm like, I have to do something with Ariel. And I contact them and we talk and we write. And it's always like, I'm not 100% sure what I'm looking for. Roxy Romero, the woman um, in the video with the really long dark hair. She's also somebody who shows up numerous times. But right now it's really, uh, Joan actually is, is 60, in her late 60s. So I'm hoping she'll be in the performance as well. Right now, I'm really interested in body shapes. Um, so having, I think, different different heights, different weights, different shapes of people's bodies is really important to me for this upcoming performance. So it shifts. Hi. Um, this is kind of an observation, but it's a rambling question, so pardon me. Um, I'm just thinking a lot about what Helen Sisu wrote about your work from the very beginning in the painting work, calling you a tailor mm -hmm. and the precision of your cut. And that's something that came up in our conversation. We went to visit your exhibition yesterday. I had a conversation with uh, the curator. And just thinking about the precision of your lines mm -hmm. and a question we had collectively as a group, so I'm not going to take ownership of it, is the the the... the selection of the tree, the cutting of the roots, the mm -hmm. precision of the line in the incision mm -hmm. process, uh, but also the presence of lines in the, the, the earth on the ground, but also in the dimensions of patterning that are overlaying over the video and the figure. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the questions we had, because it was a class on environmental aesthetics, is thinking about the, the difficulty as an artist to make that cut Mm -hmm. uh, last week, our class was doing video editing, so we all learned like the precision of having to decide when to edit the video, yeah. when to make that incision. And I was wondering, especially if you're moving towards listening to the environment and listening to to uh, the ground instead of of the figure, you know, how do you negotiate with the tension of the burden of the artist? who carries the weight of the exhibition, having to make that first cut and final cut. Yeah. Um, I think I understand your question correctly, so correct me if I'm wrong. But, um, well, one, you can't be afraid to fail publicly and just massively. You can't be afraid of it. You have to understand that that's just part of the process and assume that this is not the last video you're going to make. Now, there's, almost, there's almost rarely an end to anything, you know, and I feel like for me, um, there are paintings that maybe I showed that I didn't feel like they were totally done and they come back and I'm like, yeah, it's not done. And then maybe two years later, it's sitting, you know, stored in the studio and I'm like, I want to pull it out and see if, if I know how to finish it. So I always think you, you, everything's kind of always in process. You know, your final edit is never, doesn't have to be your final edit. Um, I know when I call something a final edit, it's because my my brain and my body is is not wanting for any more. Like, it's posed all the right questions. It's kind of raised my heartbeat where I want it to. It's given me a space to relax and calm. Um, and and it, it sort of, um, yeah, it's taken me on like an arc. That's always how I think about videos, you know? So when I'm, just, when I'm talking with editors, a lot of times, I'm talking about feelings, how I want someone to feel. And I also oftentimes will describe a shape. I'll draw a shape and I'll say, you know, like we're starting here and like, this is a really slow build. And then I refer back to that, like when maybe the edit is cutting too, too quickly. 
And I'll say, this is not the slowness. I want the kind of slowness that you're just like almost about to give up because you can't take it anymore. Like that's a different kind of slowness than just watching something steadily moving. Right. So there's those things that we play with. Um, but I think the hard part for a lot of the people who work with me, especially if they're coming from like a uh, film industry experience is wanting a storyboard, wanting to know like how to kind of effectively map out what could be a complicated video. And I always tell people at this point, I'm like, you have to stop asking me because I just, it's not in me. I don't, that's just not how I think. It's not how I work. Um, and that's helped edit who I can work with. You know, um, sound is very similar. Um, and the other thing about, I think I have always been concerned that when you're, when my content can be so easily uh, described sometimes as like, oh, it's about nature or it's like Native American. And my interest is in bringing in probably too much information and finding ways to make it feel like it belongs together. Um, I think that's where a lot of those sharp cuts come from. It's sort of like the confidence in the kind of aesthetics of, of editing is something that gives weight to what could otherwise feel like content kind of spilling over. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, a, a couple of things uh, that you said all uh, throughout seem to resonate. Um, and I really appreciate your response and amplification around why the patterning, because you wanted something you said earlier that you wanted many things to, um, that, that the patterning is about bringing in many sensibilities and histories and genealogies into a work. Mm -hmm. Um, that also then next to one of the first things you said about the early work in at the Field Museum and about learning to get permission from objects that others would think of as inanimate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just interesting to even come full circle with this image up here um, in terms of what one conventional way of thinking about the tree might think of it as an inanimate. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I wonder about the animacy of objects, I guess, and that mm -hmm. whether that's is actually wildly a through line <laughs> through all of these different media or, or a shift in some way as you go to different media. Yeah. I think, I think it's definitely increased. I mean, it, that's why it was so interesting to look back and, and put this presentation together because I could see where the, I, I could map where the ideas are coming from and how they've kind of grown over, over the years. I think for me, the beginning of it had to do, and I'm going back into the nineties now when I was working at the field museum, um, the kind of, um, absurdity that it seemed for, my job, for instance, was there were objects for which menstruating women should not be near. So here I am working in a museum where most people are not indigenous. And my job was to go around and ask and share this information with people. Yeah, that's what I had to do. <laughs> And, and to say it in a way that it's like, we're actually looking out for your safety. I'm not trying to offend. I'm not trying to upset. And also we had to think about if the object is on room three, how f does it only affect floor? I'm sorry, floor three. Does it only affect floor four and floor two? Or do we have to go to five and one? Does that make sense? So there was these things that I had to think. It's like, I know I look, I'm being asked to do something that looks in Western culture that it could be absurd. So it was very much a cultural difference between those two mindsets. And I think for me, I started thinking more and more about like why it's so difficult for us to give over American cult culturally American to give over to the idea that we are equal to the animals or we are, we can communicate. Why is this so hard? What is, what is the obstacle? And I, there's so that's a huge, course right it's like but, but i think um over the years i probably have put it into practice privately and then at some point you know it alters who you are as a person and then it's like it's like i would be closeting it if i didn't bring it to the way that i talk about my work and also i don't know how it exists today i think not so dissimilar but in the 90s you know if you talked about spirituality and artwork, you were just really pushed to the periphery <laughs> and it was not something that people would do. 
And I think for me, when you're in an artist studio with another artist, it can come up very easily, right? If you're talking to a jazz musician, if you're talking to to a gospel singer, you know, those ideas of like the, the vibrational energy of dance, of music, of communing, all of those things are um, very easy to talk about, you know. Everywhere. All right. I think um, we're at the end of an incredible conversation, traversing all kinds of media and um, issues. I'm so appreciative that Jeffrey would fly all the way out here in order to engage with us and deepen what we've been talking about throughout the semester and will continue to. Can you help me thank him for being here? Thank you. Thank you very much.